Today we will share a variety of topics in rubber aging. I hope they're helpful to you. In particular, I think the analytical techniques will be helpful to you to help you to solve your next problem. I've here added my email address if you would like to contact me with a question or contact M Mansoor and who pass on the question to me. So today we have four short stories. The first one is two mechanism aging when there's both oxidation and thermal reversion. The second topic is the effect of strain on oxidation. The third topic is the effect of antioxidant loading on service life prediction. And the fourth topic is damage mechanism during downhole rapid gas decompression testing. This is the testing that's used for you know, packers that are used in the drilling operations for oil and gas exploration. Okay, so part one is two mechanism aging, both oxidation and thermal reversion are, are present. Okay. Okay, so the first slide is background slide. This is by Ahagan. It was, uh, you know, a well published scientist who uh, worked for a tire, uh, Japanese tire company and uh, published in Rubber Chemistry and Technology. Okay, so uh, he has oxidative aging here for a natural rubber conventional cure compound and anaerobic aging at a variety of temperatures. Okay, so this data right here is oxidative aging at 70 degrees C and 80 degrees C. And then here's oxidative aging at at 80 degrees C and 90 degrees C. And then here's oxidative aging at 100 degrees C. And then here's aging at 120 degrees C. And then if we switch over to here, which he calls an anaerobic, so we have the se 70 degrees and then the uh, 80, deg 80 degrees, and then uh, 100 degrees, and then 120 degrees, and 160 degrees. So oxidation is characterized by simultaneous increase in modulus and loss in elongation to break. And anaerobic is characterized by loss in elongation to break and loss in modulus. So, um, so the type one is oxidation, type two is, uh, you know, pure anaerobic. And so today we're going to be talking about type three, where there's a combination of uh, oxidation and thermal reversion. And we're going to be using 80 degrees C for our experiments. And so the 80 degrees C data is shown here, and then the 80 degrees C anaerobic is uh, shown by this triangle right here. So we're, we're going to dive more deeply using our analytical techniques into what's going on at 80 degrees C when there's a combination of type two and type one aging. Okay, so we're gonna look at a, a let's, let's, this is kind of background here. This is 
applications where this might be important. So we say a tire wire coat may age aerobically as a stationary tile, but as a running tire, it consumes the dissolved oxygen and goes into anaerobic conditions. Earth, for example, earth mover tire, truck tire. Automotive parts such as engine mount, hose, V-belt, gasket may experience anaerobic conditions during service, but otherwise aer aerobic conditions. And then diffusion limited oxidation, which we're gonna talk more about next week, where basically that means the uh, oxygen is being consumed faster than the oxygen diffuses in, therefore you go into anaerobic, uh, can be achieved during accelerated aging. So that's a summary of why, why this is important. So uh, we looked at two natural rubber conventional cure compounds. They are aged at 80 degrees C. This is our experimental approach. It's aged 80 degrees C in air oven for four weeks followed by anaerobic aging at 80 degrees C for six more weeks. And we had two compounds, compound one with antioxidants, compound two without antioxidants. We have with, with and without one, one temperature, four, four weeks of aerobic followed by six weeks. So, you know, um, you know, this may be going, you know, every time you drive the car, you know, to work and then you drive home to work or, the uh, <clears throat> truck is on the road for uh, you know t uh, t uh, um, you know 18 hours, and then the driver sleeps for eight hours. So alternating back and forth between aerobic and anaerobic conditions might be might be happening in our parts. Okay, so here's outline of our analytical approach. The aging effects were monitored by tensile uh, storage DMA strain sweeps. Storage modulus is a function of strain oxygen content and uh, our measure of polysulfitic crosslinks extractable sulfur by triphenylphosphine. And then lastly, we modulus profiling confirmed that the aging was homogeneous through the thickness of our slabs during, during our experiments. So we, um, we, we don't want uh, diffusion limited oxidation in our you know, model experiments. Okay, so first, uh, you know, we have uh, four weeks of aerobic aging and then six, six weeks for a total of 10, 10 weeks for these experiments of uh, anaer pure anaerobic, no, no oxygen present. Remove all the dissolved oxygen, keep it in a sealed, sealed reactor. Okay, so here's uh, elongation to break as a function of time. And during the four weeks of aerobic oven aging, compound one with antioxidants, decreases elongation to break and then during anaerobic aging no no change and the compound two without antioxidants a decrease in elongation to break and then no no change during anaerobic aging kind of uh you know in good good agreement with uh, what ahagan reported in his findings. And then here is the uh, modulus data that you know, Ahagan likes to report in his analysis. So here is uh, modulus at 100 as a function of time during oven aging. And uh, it's increasing due to oxidation. 
And then during anaerobic conditions, no, no, no change. Here's uh, with, with antioxidant, without antioxidant. Okay, and then here's tensile strength as a function of aging time, aerobic and anaerobic. So here's compound one with antioxidant, decreasing in tensile strength, and then no change during anaerobic. And here's compound two without antioxidant. And so here, here we see that the compound with antioxidant is, shows less decrease in tensile strength than the compound with antioxidant. Okay, and then here's our uh, DMA strain sweep, storage modulus as a function of strain. Here's the un unaged, and then uh, 2.5 weeks of aerobic, and then four, four weeks of aerobic, and then four weeks plus six of aerobic, plus six weeks of anaerobic, and no, no, no change between uh, four weeks and, and 10 weeks. Okay, and then uh, here's um, our analytical technique called oxygen content. And this is uh, elemental analysis. So, uh, we're using, um, uh, you know, a, a known in instrument that measures the uh, oxygen content. The rubber is consumed under inert atmosphere, and the instrument measures the CO and CO2 generated and calculates percent oxygen in the con compound. So this is oxygen that shows up you know, that's chemically bonded, you know. So this is, you know, like oxygen and stearic acid, for example, or, you know, hydroxyl groups and carbonyl groups due to oxidation of the rubber. Yeah. So, so there's, you know, in the unaged, there's a certain amount of molecular oxygen in the various ingredients in the compound. And then subsequently during aging, due to oxidation of the rubber, the uh, oxygen content increases. And then during anaerobic aging, the slight, slight decrease in oxygen content. Okay, and then here's triphenylphosphine extractable sulfur as a function of aging time. So this is our measure of polysulfitic. So it's polysulfitic is, is kind of a very thermally labile or it, it's um, in that way it provides a kind of an internal, you know, thermometer or in, internal um, measure of the heat history of the compound. So we, we like to measure that. And um, so here's the four weeks of uh, aerobic aging for um, with, with antioxidant and uh, the polysulfitic content is uh, number of polysulfitic crosslinks is coming down and uh, continues to come down but, uh, during anaerobic aging. And then here's compound two without antioxidants and this is the polysulfitic is you know coming down continuously during all all 10 weeks and then here's our um, last experiment where we do modulus profile from that you know outside edge to the middle of the sample to the outside edge of our one millimeter thick slabs Here's the unaged sample, and then after two and a half weeks of aerobic aging, and then four weeks of aerobic aging, and then four weeks of aerobic plus six weeks of anaerobic. No, no, ch no change.
during the six weeks of anaerobic aging. And anyway, we don't see any um, non-uniformity, so we see no evidence of diffusion-limited oxidation. Now, all the aging was homogeneous through the thickness of our slabs. Okay, so this is the summary and conclusion for part one. Say the physical and chemical properties were measured, natural rubber conventional cure compound, which experienced aerobic aging at 80 degrees C, followed by anaerobic aging at 80 degrees C. During aerobic aging, elongation of break, tensile strength decreased, modulus of 100% increased. During anaerobic aging, little or no change in tensile properties were observed. S storage modulus between 3% and 25% strain increased during aerobic aging and remained unchanged during anaerobic aging. This suggests that any method to reduce oxygen and the compound is helpful for durability. Oxygen content increased during aerobic aging. During anaerobic aging, oxygen content decreased slightly, presumably from CO and CO2 generated from oxygenated structures. Triphenylphosphine extractable sulfur, which is a measure of the polysulfitic content, decayed during both anaerobic and aerobic aging. Polysulfitic decay appears to be independent of oxygen gas partial pressure. No diffusion limited oxidation was observed in these age sheets. Okay, ready for our second question? How does strain affect oxidation? Is there any difference between no strain, aging with no strain, aging with static strain, or aging with dynamic strain? Do they differ, and so how do they differ? By way of background, Shelton at Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio, and Afghan, Japanese tire company, and Gil Gillen at Sandia National Laboratory published on this topic. And Shelton at Ahagan reported that strain catalyzed the rate of oxidation. Gillen reported that strain did not catalyze the rate of oxidation. And uh, you'll see that our, our data is more in line with the findings of, of Gillen. Okay, so we have uh, natural rubber, conventional sulfur cure, and these are the uh, aging conditions. 70 degrees C, no st strain, static strain at 100% elongation, dynamic strain, with peak to peak dynamic strain amplitude of 60%. And we also have 50 degrees C dynamic strain, peak to peak dynamic strain amplitude 20%. And then we have 55 degrees, no strain, static strain at 100% elongation, dynamic strain, peak to peak dynamic strain amplitude 10%. And we have 65 degrees, no strain, static strain at 100% elongation and dynamic strain, peak to peak dynamic strain amplitude 10%. And this outline of the testing, cross-link density, oxygen content, tensile properties, dynamic mechanical properties by strain sweeps. So uh, here is the cross-link density. As a fu function of time, okay, for the 70 degree and, and the 50 degree. 
So here, 70 degrees C, no, no strain, shown in the blue diamonds. And then here's 70 degrees C, static strain, 100% elongation, shown in, in the pink squares. And then here's cross length density as a function of time, 70 degrees C, dynamic strain, peak to peak, dynamic strain amplitude, 60%. The red asterisk. And then we have 50 degrees C, dynamic strain, peak to peak, dynamic strain amplitude, 20%. 50 degrees is here. And then we have this room temperature data, we, you know, seems like no, no measurable change in cross link density. So we say our initial observation is that cross link density was independent of the strain conditions. You know, the no strain, static strain, dynamic strain, tracking the same right on top of each other. Time and temperature or go governing the, the oxidation, or gover governing the changes in cross link density due to oxidation. And then here's oxygen content as a function of time for various aging conditions. So here's 70 degrees C, no strain. Here's 70 degrees C, static strain, 100% elongation. And here's the dynamic strain, peak to peak dynamic strain amplitude, 60%. And again, it seems to be tracking And then here's the 50 degrees C dynamic strain amplitude and then the 100 degrees C dynamic, excuse me, room, room temperature um, dynamic strain experiments where it seems to be no, no change. So from that data, we can calculate the oxygen consumption rates for the no strain, the static strain. And we say there, you know, the oxygen, calculated oxygen consumption rates are very, very similar. And here I refer to, you know, the publication by Ken Gillen and he made, you know, stainless steel reactors with bellows so that he could measure oxygen consumption rate with and without dynamic strain. And he measured the same oxygen consumption rate with, with and without dynamic strain. Okay, so our summary for the oxygen content results, it appears that oxidation is independent of strain conditions, time and temperature dependent only. Okay, so here is our tensile results. We tried to use tensile measurements for kinetics and mechanism activation energy of oxidation under various strain conditions. Let's see if we could see any difference. We age strips and uh, the three different techniques and then subsequently cut out dumbbells after aging for tensile properties. So here, oops, excuse me, it's kind of slow, there we go. So here is stress strain properties as a function of aging, no, no, no strain. So we have the 70 degrees C, the 55 degrees C, and the 65 degrees C. And so, um, We have the, the uh, un, unaged, the dark blue, and then we have the uh, you know, the set 70, 70 degrees, and then the 65 degrees, and the 
55 degrees shown here. And then here is the um, stat static strain. And we have 70 degrees C, 65 degrees C, and 55 degrees C data. And then here we have the uh, dynamic the samples that were dynamic st strained and then subsequently tensile properties measured. Dynamically strained at 70 degrees C, 55 degrees C, and 65 degrees C. So, um, I should I might say that you know talk about messy data. This was this was messy messy data, but uh, we. Plow, plowed ahead. Uh, actually, uh, one of the great uh, fun things that happened was my daughter was able to work for me that summer and um, did a lot of this, which was kind of a personal uh, <clears throat> highlight for me. Okay, so this is Ahagon plot of, of the data. And um, we have the no, no strain the and the static strain and the dynamic strain. And it, I mean, you know, it, it seem, seemed like in this analysis that they're uh, very, very, very similar. This is the, this is the six, 65 degree data. Okay. And um, next, we want to show you. Um, so you know, we we tried various ways to analyze the data, and uh, so one day, you know, we had the idea. Let's try energy to break. Energy to break is the integrated area under the stress strain curve, tensile stress strain curve. So we had some success for that. So we want to show you that, and we we normalized it. You know, to the the unaged. So un, unaged is normalized to one. And so here's here's our seventy degrees C uh, dynamic strain data, and then here's the sixty five degrees, and then fifty five degrees, and then fifty degrees. So subsequently do the best we can to uh, shift this data to generate a master curve. So we have normalized energy to break as a function of a reduced time at 65 degrees C. So now we have ener energy to break as a function of aging time at 65 degrees C using, using all the data. Okay, and then so here is the the master curves for all all three: the dynamic strains, static strain, and no strain. So the the no strain is the uh, yellow triangles. So here is um, normalized energy to break as a function of reduced time at sixty five degrees C. The yellow triangles. And then if we go to static strain, the pink squares, and then uh, the dynamic strain data is in the blue diamonds. And then we plot the sh shift factors for the three strains. And here's the no, no strain, static strain, and dynamic strain. 
And then subsequently, here's the activation energy for all strain types, you know, 25, 24, 22. So our conclusion is shown here, you know, from cross-link density, oxygen content, and energy to break, they were governed solely by chemical reaction rate kinetics of oxidation, independent of strain conditions. That means the strains that were used in this study. You know, uh, no, no, I should say, no, no strain aging is satisfactory for simulating aging in the belt, belt coat, you know, ba based on the study, you know, although in service, the part is under dynamic strain for part of its life cycle. Okay. So we're uh, ready for the next topic. So we asked the question, what's the effect of uh, antioxidant loading on service life prediction? Okay. And so we want to, you know, predict the aging resistance or the antioxidant stabilization at ambient temperatures. You know, usually we do the aging, you know, it's uh, accelerated or higher temperatures, and we assume that the rankings are, this, are valid for ambient temperatures or service temperatures. So we're going to ask the question what's the effect of antioxidant loading on service life? or the aging at ambient temperatures. And so um, we have three compounds. This is model natural rubber conventional cure compound, 2.5 PHR antioxidant, 1.25 PHR antioxidant loading, and no antioxidant. The 2.5 PHR has one PHR of 6 PPD, one PHR of TMQ, and 0.5 PHR diphenyl paraphenylene diamine. And the 1.25 compound has 0.5, 6 PPD, 0.5 PHR TMQ, and 0.25 PHR diphenyl paraphenylene diamine. Okay. So here's oxygen consumption rate as a function of aging time. And um, if you look at the 80 degrees C data and compare the no antioxidant with the one that's fully loaded, you see that the compound with, without antioxidant is oxidizing faster than the compound that has antioxidants. So this is the you know, ranking that we expect. But if you look at the 21 degrees C aging, the compound with 2.5 PHR of antioxidant, you know, these pur purple circles, are oxidizing f faster in general than the, the, the green diamonds which are the compound without antioxidant. And then if you look at intermediate temperatures, seems like the compounds are aging about the same rate. So, you know, it suggests that using the high temperature data may not give you quite exactly the right ranking for the uh, low temperature or a service temperature, ambient temperature prediction that you want. So here is the integrated oxygen consumption rate data. And then for 80 degrees C, 
see that the compound with no antioxidant is oxidizing faster than the compound with antioxidant, as uh, we would expect. But if you look at 21.5 degrees C, the compound with antioxidant is oxidizing faster than the compound without antioxidant. And then if you look at the intermediate temperature, 45 degrees C, they, they all seem to be the same. Okay, and then just to remind you, we subsequently make a master curve by horizontal shifting of the integrated oxygen consumption rate data. And uh, we get these, sh these shift factors. Which, uh, here's a plot of the shift factors. Experimentally derived shift factors as a function of inverse temperature. And uh, we're gonna use those to shift the data onto the ambient temperature, sur service temperatures. And uh, we might note that it seems like there's some deviation from linear Arrhenius behavior in the 1.25 PHR antioxidant compound and in the 2.5 PHR antioxidant compound. Okay, now we go to the elongation to break data. Here's elongation to break as a function of aging time. 70 degrees C. Here's the no, no antioxidant and then the 1.25 and the, the 2.5. So it seems there's uh, the no antioxidant is aging quite a bit faster but the 1.25 and 2.5 PHR antioxidant compounds are similar. And then if we go to the 80, 80 degrees C data, here's the uh, no antioxidant, and then 1.25, and then the 2.5. And no antioxidant is aging the fastest, but uh, it seems like the uh, 2.5 is aging faster than the 1.25 at 80 degrees C. And then if we go to 95 degrees C, you see the no antioxidant is aging faster than the compounds with antioxidants. And it appears that the 1.25 and 2.5 PHR loaded compounds are tracking kind of right on right on top of each other. Okay, and then subsequently, uh, we make a master curve by horizontal shifting from our 70, 80, and 95 degree data. Here's the master curve for the 2.5 PHR antioxidant compound. And then here is the empirical shift factors or experimental shift factors versus inverse temperature for the 2.5 PHR compound. Here's the elongation to break data, and here's the oxygen consumption shift factors. So we do that now for the other two compounds, and, um, and then subsequently uh, generate a uh, master curve which is shifted to 22.6 and this is the average annual temperature in phoenix arizona one of the hottest cities in the united states and so uh you know here we see elongation to break you know one one year two year three year four year so so on And now we compare the predicted elongation to break for the three materials. So we're using all the shift factors 
to shift the data you know, from measure, measured rates of aging from 95 degrees to 21 degrees. And uh, so we say this is the, uh, the properties as a function of reduced time at 22.6 degrees C for no antioxidant and then compound with 1.25 and then the compound with 2.5. So from this, this data, clearly the no antioxidant is, is the worst. And then it appears that uh, the 1.25 is, um, when you look at, you know, beyond four, four years, is performing be better than the 2.5. So we say ultra-sensitive oxygen consumption and physical property, time, temperature, superposition. is a technique that has allowed us to rank the aging resistant at ambient temperatures. We said oxygen oxidation possibly uh, consists of the following mechanism. Below 45 degrees, predominantly hydroperoxide formation, and then above 45 degrees C, predominantly uh, free radical formation. The results suggest that the antioxidants, you know, were less effective against hydroperoxide formation. However, they were effective as free radical traps. So we say. Um, we think that the antioxidant is probably also participating as a pro-oxidant. That means it's um, ox reacting with the molecular oxygen in the air and uh, generating an oxidized form of the antioxidant. So we say antioxidant levels that cause significant pro-oxidant effect may not be beneficial for aging resistance, possibly detrimental. And then we ask the question, what happens when you look at the same compounds in crack growth resistance? So here's the crack length as a function of number of cycles for the same three compounds. There's crack length as a function number of cycles, no antioxidant. Here's our 1.25, and here's our 2.5 antioxidant load. And you can see from going from no antioxidant to 1.25 PHR, significant reduction in uh, crack growth rates, significant improvement in crack growth resistance. But then when you go from 1.25 to 2.5, there's an improvement, but not uh, as much. So we say, you know, kind of as, gui as guidelines, we might say, based on this work, antioxidant benefits level off between one and three PHR loading for oxidation resistance. Further AO lo levels that cause significant pro-oxidation may not be, be beneficial for aging resistance, possibly detrimental. And we say antioxidant levels level off at higher levels for crack growth resistance and probably ozone resistance. So just, just oxidation, probably leveling off in this range, but um, for crack growth resistance and ozone resistance, probably leveling off at, at higher loadings. Okay, we ready, ready for the fourth one? We'll probably go through this a little faster. Okay, so this is the damage mechanism in oil and gas formulations during downhole testing. 
purpose is to better understand the damage mechanisms during downhole simulation testing, rapid gas decompression testing. We call our RGD, rapid gas decompression test. So the way we asked our question is, we're not trying to explain the explosive failure mechanism during decompression. Rather, what is the chemical damage mechanism during exposure, which presumably is you know, the major effect or one of the major effects on the explosive failure? For that reason, we performed slow decompression to prevent the sample from exploding. You know, so we had good intact samples that we could do our physical and chemical testing. So the uh, scope of the work is shown here. We had three downhole formulations, FKM, HNVR, and NVR. We used the downhole simulation test method called NACE TMO192. The damage mechanism was elucidated by various characterization tests. Okay, so our motivation is to try to understand the key chemical damage mechanism during rapid gas decompression downhole exposure of rubber compounds. Okay, here's the outline of the of the uh, test plan. Properties were measured as a function of exposure time using the following tests. DMA strain sweep, tensile properties, we call machine groove trouser tear, which is uh, also called molded groove trouser tear, modulus profiling. And for mechanistic understanding, we um, compared the results with uh, CO2 solubility. The role of CO2 solubility was examined. Okay, so here's a description of the RGT test, RGD test that we used, NACE TMO 192 rapid gas decompression test. Conditions are 100% CO2, 5.2, megapascal, which is about 750 PSI at room temperature. And we did a slow release. Uh, we used for de decompression, we used a slow release in order to prevent damage to the specimens. We varied the exposure time from one day to 28 days. So uh, here are the, the three formulations that we used, FKM, NBR, HNBR. And um, FKM and HNBR are um, peroxide cured. And uh, NBR is a efficient sulfur cure. Okay, and then here the volume and weight change during and after CO2 exposure. So here's the volume change measured immediately after degassing. So, you know, 25%, 45%, and 24% for the three compounds. And then we measured volume change after 10, 10 minutes. And the FKM you know, decreased from 25 to 12, and the NBR decreased from 45 to 35. Oh, the HNBR increased in increased in size, and I said presumably nitrogen and oxygen are diffusing in into the compound faster than this the CO2 is uh, diffusing out. And then we measured increase in weight, 4%, you know, 4%, 8% after 10, after 10, min, 10 minutes after degassing. And then volume change, two days after degassing, 
we expect it to go back to zero. This has slight decrease in volume, slight increase in volume, a slight increase in volume. And then here's the increase in weight two days after degassing. And all of them have a slight in increase in weight. Okay, so we're going to look at tensile properties and DMA properties and modulus profile properties and um, machine groove trouser tear properties. So here first is the tensile properties as a function of exposure for the FKM. And uh, you know if you look closely, you know the note no, the uh, modulus in the low strain region of the no exposure is appears to be higher than the modulus after exposure in the low strain region, for example, the 28, 28 day. And then uh, if we compare the tensile properties in the low strain region for the NBR, here's the, uh, the modulus slope of no exposure and then here's the modulus initial modulus slope of the five day and then we look at the tensile properties as a function of exposure for the hnbr in the low strain region here's the modulus slope of no exposure and then here's the initial modulus slope after one day so we say the there was observed decrease in modulus in the low strain region, presumably softening Mullen's effect, presumably the result of swelling stretching under CO2 pressure. And then here's the DMA strain sweep data at 30 degrees C as a function of exposure time for FKM. So here's no, no exposure, one day, five day, 28 day. If you look in the the range about you know one one to five percent appears that the modulus is in, in decreasing as a function of exposure and here's the uh, NBR you have no no exposure one one day five day twenty eight day and uh, clearly all modulus results of the exposed samples are lower than the unexposed. And then here's the DMA strain sweep, 30 degrees C. It's a function of exposure time for HNBR. Here's the no, no exposed, one, one day, five day, 28 day. So we decided to anal analyze this data. We took the modulus at 0.1% and plotted that as a function of aging time, or I should say exposure time. So here's the uh, storage modulus at 0.1% as a function of exposure time for the NBR and then for the FKM and then for the HNBR. So we just took those three rates and plot them as a function of volume change. You remember the NBR had 45% initial change, initial volume change after degassing and the other two were about 25%, 24%. Seems to correlate with the modulus decay. And then here is our modulus profile results. No, no exposure, one, one day, five day, 28 day. Clearly the fi five day is low, lower than the no exposure. Here's modulus as a function, relative position for NBR for the various exposure times. Here's uh, no, no exposure, one day, five day, 28 day. 
And then uh, here's modulus profile, function of relative position, going from the outside edge to the center of the slab to the outside edge of the slab. Here's no, no exposure, one, one, one day, five day, 28 day. And here clearly the modulus is lower in all of the ex exposed samples. So summary of the DMA strain sweep and modulus profiling. Observed a decrease in the low strain modulus. We would say this is softening or Mullins effect. Modulus decay was explained by swelling, stretching under CO2 pressure. Okay. And I think this is our last test. So this is the uh, tear force as a function of displacement for the FKM as a function of exposure time. So here's no, no exposure. And then we have a one, one, one day and then five, five day and then uh, 20, 28 day. And then here's tear force as a function of displacement as a, with, for the various um, exposure times. So here's NBR, no exposure, NBR one day, NBR five day, NBR 28 day. So this is you know, stepping down with exposure time. And then here's tear force as a function displacement for HNBR. Here's a no, no exposure, one, one day, five day, 28 day. And clearly the compounds were exposed to have a reduction in tear resistance. So we plotted tear strength as a function of exposure time. And uh, here's our, is our N NBR, and then uh, here's the a HNBR and the uh, FKM. So we just took these these rates, you know, and this is, you know, kind of uh, HNBR and FKM are kind of, uh, you know, very very little change, um, and the the NBR has, you know, significant change. You know, R, R squared 0.96. So again, we plot this tear strength loss rate as a function of volume change. And you remember that we measured the volume change immediately after degassing. NBR had a 45 percent increase in volume while the other two compounds had about a 24 percent increase and it seems to be uh, you know helping to explain the uh, tear strength data okay so we come now here last two or three slides our summary of this fourth short story um, tensile properties, dynamic mechanical strain sweep properties, storage modulus, and modulus profile, and molt machine groove trouser tear were measured as a function of CO2 exposure time for three oil gas drill packer type formulations. The modulus decay rate was proportional to volume change in CO2. The tear strength loss rate was proportional to volume change due to CO2 exposure. We say the mechanism of deterioration of physical properties was swelling stretching during CO2 exposure associated with decay and modulus, modulus Mullins type softening. The loss in tear strength also correlated with swelling stretching during CO2 exposure. Presumably the damage mechanism is decay in polymer filler interaction caused by swelling stretching. 
Okay, so I, I put uh, this one um, final, final slide here. Last week there was a question about uh, UV exposure. And so I said, if you're trying to include you know, ozone or UV into your service life prediction, ozone exposure or ultraviolet exposure i have the, f the following three suggestions i see i said see the publication by ken gillen for including the effect of gamma radiation and temperature on service life he presented this paper uh 20 2018 uh technical meeting of the acs rubber division and then I said, try to include the effects of ozone concentration, ultraviolet light intensity and temperature to get the shift factors for the ozone or the UV. Use tensile properties for ozone. I said, use oxygen consumption rate for, for UV. And I add that uh, I plan to try to evaluate ozone exposure on service life and UV exposure on service life in, um, in, in, in future research. So I think this brings us to our very last slide. And I just mentioned here that uh, you know, a week from today, we plan to try to discuss the following two topics. One is modulus profiling and the other is diffusion limited oxidation model. Say modulus profiling to understand damage mechanism, non-homogeneities, modulus variations, compound interfaces. And then secondly, introduction to diffusion limited oxidation model. Mansoor, this paper is open for questions. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terrell, for such an insightful presentation on rubber aging. And I'm sure that uh, the participants have got a better understanding on the topic now. So we will take a few questions which we have uh, from the participants. Uh, the first question is, uh, autoclave aging comes under aerobic or anaerobic uh, aging. And have you come across any comparison between over aging and autoclave aging since air pressure is involved in the autoclave? I, I think that's aer <clears throat> aerobic. I think there's plenty of oxygen in there. Um, so uh, you need to try to protect, I, I think, I mean, you, you probably know better than me, but you need to try to protect. So what, what happens at, at high temperature is you go into diffusion limited oxidation. It's another, another consideration. So the outside will be oxidizing, but the inside will be under anaerobic conditions. So, you know, you might think about like a sacrificial layer on the outside, you know, um, you know that you, if you can cover it and then peel, peel, it, off, peel it off afterwards, something like, something like that. I guess that's, I think that's really all I have to say about that topic. Any, any uh, feedback on that? All right. Uh, we will go for the next question then. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So why does the colored products, even, you know, white products uh, changes the color after aging and uh, how to increase the color retention property? Uh, can you suggest some additives to overcome this issue? Um, so I think that um, you're talking about, you know, UV absorbers, you know, I, I'm certainly not an expert at that, so, but I, I think you have to um, think about your ultraviolet added stabilization additives and um, what, what I know 
is that um, most of it's done by trial and error. You know, they just try all the uh, UV additives on the market and try them, see which, see which one is working for you. All right. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you measure the energy to break? Yes. So, um, so we have, uh, we, 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 we like, we like to do that. It's sometimes, you know, more, more informative than the tensile or the elongation or the modulus. So the energy to break is the integrated area under the stress strain curve. So, um, you know, you're multiplying stress, which is, um, uh, new Newtons per meter squared times strain, which is meters over meters. So you have Newton meters divided by meters cubed. So you have joules. So that's joules per meter cubed. So, you know, it's ener energy for the volume of the sample in the test zone. I hope that helps. All right, all right. Uh, the last question uh, for the day is, is there any research done at low temperature aging? Oh, that it, is, it is an important topic. I think, um, I think it's an issue particularly for polychloroprene. If, um, I think, you know, um, you know, some, some elastomers can, um, you know, I think they, I think they crystallize, you know, and uh, so you, you have to, um, you know, it's, it's, I think the mechanism is a lot different. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's hard, it's getting too hard and brittle, you know, so uh, you have to make sure the compound has enough flexibility at low temperature. So, um, you know, and if it's, you know, you put it in a certain amount of time, it's slowly crystallizing and it gets too hard. So um, it, 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 low, low temperature aging can be an issue for some compounds.